In the early spring of 1921, Colonel Frank Moffat, the manager of the Knoxville Patriots, an Appalachian League baseball team, made his way to Ashland, Kentucky. The colonel had heard stories about a lanky right-handed pitcher who people said could throw like Walter Johnson. This is where a most incredible story begins. Gary, last time we talked, I told you about Squire Potter, a pitching prospect from the Kentucky Hills. Well, I just got there and I'm going to check him out. It was a long train ride from Knoxville to Ashland, a town of about 15,000 people. When I got here late this afternoon, I asked people how to get to Indian Run, where Potter lives. They laughed and said, you can't get there from here. Your baseball friend, Frank. I stayed at the Henry Clay Hotel last night and hopefully I will find my way today to Indian Run, where Potter lives. The desk clerk gave me directions. He said, take the gravel road to Russell, then turn left at the mailbox marked Wheeler. Then go up a steep hill on a narrow winding road and there will be the prettiest flat woods you've ever seen. Well, that's advance, population about 300. Once you get there, it's another six to seven miles to end in run. And it's not much of a road, more suitable for a horse and wagon than a car. But then he warned me, be careful. Dressed up like you are, people are liable to mistake you for a revenuer. Lots of people out there make moonshine. Well, Gary, I'll report back when I've found Squire Potter. Just who was this Squire Potter that a famous baseball man like Colonel Frank Moffat had come so far to see him? Somehow, word had reached Moffat that a 20-year-old kid had a fastball that batters could hear but could barely see and a curveball that could uncork a bottle of wine. I spent most of today trying to find someone who would drive me to Indian Run, but everyone really thought I was a federal agent. Apparently, many of the good people of Indian Run are not exactly obeying the prohibition law. So I'm staying in the safety of my hotel room while a deputy sheriff tracks down Squire Potter and tells him that a professional baseball scout wants to meet him. We shall see how this works out. I met Squire Potter for the first time today. Well, he does pitch a lot like Walter Johnson. He pitched to me at Indian Run Ball Field, and I have no doubts about his ability as a player. My only concern is how well he can adapt to being in Knoxville, a city of 77,000 people. He's still a kid, and he's not very comfortable around strangers. Squire Potter and I had a good train ride from Ashland to Knoxville. He was all eyes looking out the window. He's never been far from home, and even though he worked for the railroad until today, he'd never actually ridden a train. He said the l &N station in Knoxville was the biggest, most prettiest building he had ever seen. I got Squire a room in a boarding house close to the ballpark. Before he even unpacked his suitcase, I took him to the field. And he asked, what's that bump in the middle of the infield? <laughs> it turns out that he has never pitched off a mound. Frank Moffat was so enthralled with Squire's raw talent that he barely noticed that the baseball field in Indian Run didn't have a pitcher's mound. And he didn't know that Squire had never worn baseball shoes. He pitched in rubber-soled basketball shoes. During Squire's first few weeks in Knoxville, Colonel Moffat had Squire pitch batting practice so he could get used to throwing off a mound. However, Squire did not give up pitching in his rubber-soled shoes. Every time someone would suggest that he wear cleats, he'd say, them shoes has spikes coming out the bottom. They make me trip and fall. Squire's first game on May 29, 1922, the Knoxville Sentinel reported that, quote, Squire Potter has at last ascended to the mound against the Kingsport Indians and looks like a real find. The Kingsport team said that he was better than last year's best pitcher in the league, six foot four inch Shove Hodge, who had since been purchased by the Detroit Tigers for $2,000. Three days later, Potter was the starting pitcher in his first home appearance. Squire didn't disappoint the home crowd either. He set a new Appalachian League record with 13 strikeouts in a 6-3 win. 
The summer of 1922 was unlike anything ever seen in professional baseball in Tennessee. Squire pitched every four or five days, and in the majority of his games, he threw a shutout. However, his blinding speed was not accompanied with great control. While he was the league's best pitcher in wins and strikeouts, he also led in walks and in wild pitches. At this time in baseball history, minor league teams made their money by scouting and signing good local players and then selling the best of them to a major league club. The biggest example of this was in 1914 when the Boston Red Sox bought the contract of a pitcher named George Herman Ruth and two other players from the minor league Baltimore Orioles for the unheard of sum of $25,000. And yes, all the money went to the Orioles. Ruth's first year salary with the Red Sox was $1,300. With that context, Colonel Frank Moffat was most surprised with what happened near the end of the 1922 season. I got the biggest surprise of my baseball life yesterday. I got a phone call from Ty Cobb, the greatest hitter who ever lived, who is the player manager of the Detroit Tigers. He has been following our boy Squire Potter all season, and he wants to buy Potter's contract from us. Get this, he offered me $25,000. I heard that John McGraw of the New York Giants is also interested in Squire, so I'm waiting for a few days before I respond to Cobb. You aren't going to believe this. I just got off the phone with Mr. Clark Griffith, owner of the Washington Senators, Somehow, he heard that Ty Cobb was bragging that he was about to buy Potter's contract for $25,000. Well, I just closed the deal to sell Squire to the Senators for $30,000. I tell you, Gary, the Colonel is pretty happy today. Just a few weeks before the beginning of spring training, Squire married a widow woman with four children. She would not be allowed to accompany Squire to Florida. To fully understand what happened in spring training, you need to know that the 1920 census shows Squire as the oldest of 12 children living in the same small house on Indian Run, along with Squire's parents. The family house did not have what was called indoor plumbing nor electricity. The nearest phone was likely in Russell, perhaps 10 miles away, and his education was a few years at the one-room Indian Run school. When Squire got to Tampa, he was in a big city where he knew nobody, including his new teammates. Those men traveled on Pullman cars and spent road trips in fine hotels and were famous celebrities in the nation's capital. They saw Squire as a bumpkin without social graces. And the Senators players, especially the other pitchers who were fighting for a place on the roster, were none too kind to Potter. Like all the other players, Squire checked into the Tampa Bay Hotel, which was a 511-room resort hotel opened in 1890 by railroad magnate Henry B. Plant. The hotel was 900 feet long, five stories high, and had rooms with their own baths, and all had electricity and telephones, amenities that were considered quite a luxury at the time. The boy from Indian Run must have been overwhelmed by the surroundings. He spent one night there, then disappeared without notice. On the second morning of spring training, Squire was nowhere to be seen. The Knoxville newspaper later reported that Squire wandered aimlessly about the spacious Tampa Bay Hotel, trying to figure out what it was all about. He had trouble finding the dining room, located about six blocks down a winding corridor. After he got there, he failed to enjoy the meal as he could neither translate the menu nor keep the peas on his knife. It was a tragic session. Later, he again wandered into the lobby, but rushed out again, thinking he had stumbled into the ladies' room by mistake. Fashionable ladies in evening gowns were much in evidence. The rest of the day was spent with Squire brooding on the intricacies of being in a big league training camp. He believed he was a good pitcher, but would never learn all the ways of a big town. The article ended with Squire saying, quote, I want to go home. I miss my sweet little woman. I can't get to going without her. And in the inky darkness of the night, he packed his other shirt and collar in his suitcase and crept stealthily out of the camp, 
singing something about my old Kentucky home as he was driven toward the railroad station. A Washington newspaper reported, quote, Squire Potter is back again with the Washington Nats. You may remember he took a French leave from the training camp in Florida in the spring and was assumed to go back to the Kentucky Hills. Well, he is back with the Washington club now. The senator sent him to Greenville, Mississippi in the Cotton States League. He went so well, winning nine and losing two games, that the senators decided they could use him in Washington. He is there now. A week later, on August 7, 1923, Squire Potter finally made his major league debut. Cleveland played at Washington, and the Tribe won in a blowout. Frank Bauer of the Indians became one of the few players to get six hits in one game that day. None of the Senators' pitchers could stop the barrage. Potter came in to relieve in the seventh inning when the score was already 9-1 to one and the bases were filled almost constantly. The final score was 22 to 2. Potter gave up nine runs on 11 hits in three innings. He walked four, struck out one, and had one wild pitch. The only bright spot in Potter's outing is that he faced future Hall of Famer Tris Speaker three times, and he got no hits. That was Potter's only appearance in a major league game. In February of 1924, with snow on the ground in Indian Run, Potter signed with Decatur of the 3I League, who had been league champions the previous year. He was welcomed with open arms. The Decatur, Illinois Herald and Review wrote about him, quote, Squire Potter is a real son of the mountains, standing six feet two inches, raw bone, muscular, and lithe. He is the sort of fellow one might picture in a melodrama of the movies as typical of the Kentucky Mountaineers. The article also mentioned that he was backwards to a degree in the presence of strangers. But when Squire was three weeks late in reporting to the team, he sent word that his wife was ill and that he would be late in joining the team. Several days later, the newspaper had a brief saying, quote, Squire Potter, Indian Run, Kentucky. Pitcher joined the camp yesterday. He is a huge chap. He throws right-handed. Potter made his first start on May 16, 1924, but the headlines the next day reflected the disappointment with their new hurler. He lost 7-3 to Bloomington. After that article, there is no newspaper mention of Squire Potter as a professional ball player. One might speculate just why Clark Griffith would spend $30,000 on 20-year-old Squire Potter. One obvious answer is that he saw Potter with nearly as much potential as Walter Johnson. Both were six feet one right-handed pitchers who threw sidearm with blazing speed. In a different era, Potter might have been nurtured and brought up slowly, given a chance to mature and develop. For example, Nolan Ryan had a ferocious fastball, but his control issues left him with a losing win-loss record after six years in the majors he went on to become one of the all-time greats of baseball. How good could Potter have been? We will never know. But we do know that he never lost his love of the game. Newspaper accounts near his hometown show that he continued to pitch for various local teams in eastern Kentucky for several years after his moment in the sun. And this rare photo shows him with the team that he managed. In 1973, 50 years after Squire was with the Washington Senators, an Ashland journalist who would become a producer of baseball documentaries learned about Squire's major league past. His article quotes Squire, quote, I left the Senators because I was homesick. I was just a country boy who loved baseball. I still love baseball. Just imagine me, a boy from Indian Run, Kentucky, I was a teammate of Walter Johnson. I have no regrets. Squire did get one lasting baseball tribute long after he died. In 2014, Squire Potter was one of the first honorees in the Ashland, Kentucky's Central Park Baseball Hall of Fame, near where Potter grew up. He was inducted on the same day as was Cincinnati Red Star Don Gullett, who grew up about 15 miles away or just one holler away from where Potter had grown up 50 years earlier.